Welcome to the 16th episode of Rivana Review, a program of stories, features, and book reviews. My name is Robert Boucheron. I will be your host for a half hour of reading aloud with illustrations. The print magazine, Rivana Review, is published four times a year in Charlottesville, Virginia, on the Rivana River. The magazine is available in bookstores on the Main Street Mall in Charlottesville and other bookstores in Virginia. You can order a copy or a subscription from the website, rivanareview.com. Contributors live all over the world and they write about places far and wide. Book reviews are of small press titles and authors you may not know about. In this episode, we will visit two men building a fence in West Virginia, a teenage boy and his first love in suburban Potomac, Maryland, the miniature stage of the toy theater, two books of stories set in Appalachia, and a true crime novel set in Rome, a murder case in the modern city. To read the books mentioned, please visit your local bookstore or the public library. Story, Kerr by Rob Giranek. Several miles downriver from the nearest town, life in this West Virginia county was a dull monotone, like a bow drawn against the D string of a fiddle. Summer days were hot and long, the sun moved slowly across the sky, and the work that needed doing didn't pay. Cattle clustered in the shade across the field, their heads and tails whipping to deter flies, while two men moved methodically along a stubborn fence line. Luke finished pounding a metal stake into the hard ground. Nearby and looking down the line, Davy, the experienced foreman of this fence building of production, anticipated the next stake, gazed in its direction, then drifted into a story of domestic tranquility lost and found. This old boy we called Kerr, maybe short for Kerwin or Curtis, he used to work on the road with us back when we was doing subcontract work for the state after the big storm in 1998. Luke waited, wiped the sweat from his brow, and glanced toward Davy. This might be good. Kerr was a great big old boy, kind of quiet, stuck to himself, you know, Davy said. Luke moved past Davy under the slanting light of mid-morning and took a T-post forward to the next position. Well, he had an old lady, and one time he got in a fight with her in the front yard. He used to get drunk and beat her bad, but this time she saw it coming, so she ran to the car to get away. Davy took a step forward vaguely, as if the story moved ahead of the job at hand in this morning's reverie. He paused to gather the memory up from darkness. Davy had lost an eye when, years before, a factory boiler exploded in his face, and Luke could never be sure where he was looking nor what he saw. She had the window down, and they was hollering at each other. When he ran at her in the car, she was ready for that, too. As he reached through the window to grab her, she rolled it up and caught both his arms in the crack snug. Luke began to tap the T-post into the ground, then stopped to conjure the big man's arms wedged into the closed driver's side window of the car. He felt a nervous twitch. Then she started to drive through the yard. Davy paused with a satisfied smile. Now that the story had returned fully to him, he wanted to savor the image. They're going through the yard in a slow loop, and Kerr was hollering, I'm going to kill you, bitch. I'm going to kill you for this. She sped up a little bit and went along by the garden. Kerr was just a trotting alongside, and he kept hollering. After a while, Kerr started to get tired. His yelling lightened up until soon he was a-crying, still telling her he's going to kill her. Old Kerr, he was a bad bully. When it looked like Kerr's going to fall down and be dragged alongside the car, his wife slowed to a crawl and said, I'll let you go if you promise you'll never beat me again. Kerr yelled he'd kill her when she let him go, so she sped up again, and Kerr started trotting again. But this time he's not hollering, he's howling with pain. He shouted, all right, I won't never beat you again, woman. She stopped the car and rolled down the window. Kerr fell to his knees, whimpering like a baby. Davy paused again, looked up who knows where, maybe in the direction where the fence line was headed, maybe at the clouds pasted across the sky. And he ain't never beat her since. Kerr is a man of his word, but for telling me this story, he's played it real quiet. 
Story, The Yerbalese by Tremaine Zenos. My father's house was empty when I returned. I dissolved a cup of synthetic charcoal in the bathroom sink, then massaged it into my scalp with latex gloves and let the stuff sit. I took my time watching the clock, delaying for as long as possible the heart-pounding terror of picking up the telephone. I wondered how I'd handle it if I were actually cool. What would Robert Smith have said to a girl on the telephone? William Reed, Trent Reznor. I rinsed the excess from my head until the black water ran clear. My hair would take forever to dry. I put mascara on one set of eyelashes, clockwork orange style. Perfect hair would have made me invincible, but mine would curl in all the wrong places. I studied myself in the mirror to avoid looking at the telephone. The world outside was quiet except for the crickets, and the moon hadn't come out yet. I lit a candle to avoid turning on the light. Shadows closed in around me. The telephone was a terrible instrument. Simply picking up the receiver and dialing seemed to bring the apocalypse closer. Then again, Bahar had never been home when I called before, and I clung to the hope that she wouldn't pick up this time, but she did. Any interest in coming to see Newt Skedaddle? I tried to sound casual. Why do you like that band? It's an excuse to get out of the house. I have no trouble getting out of the house. Well, okay then. As I staggered off the battlefield, my father called me downstairs for boiled pierogies slathered with day-glow cheese. I pulled out a log chair at the log table. I knew my father had made the whole meal when I saw the bowl of what he called salad, chopped iceberg lettuce into which he tossed a handful of raisins. Where's Sally? I asked. Out. My father stared at me with something resembling contempt. She's not eating with us? She had something to do. He tonged me up a serving of iceberg and raisins and pushed the two bottles of dressing my way. There were always two types, Russian and ranch. One was my father's preference and the other my stepmother's. I could never keep straight which was which. From the start, I'd thought Sally was an odd choice. Her cooking was only slightly better than my father's. She worked at a photography studio making sets for food advertisements. She poured acid over steak to make it steam and drizzling white glue on cereal. These days she was gone for weeks on end taking business trips to exotic places like Wyoming, returning to live with my father for less and less of the time. When she was home, she'd pace back and forth in the kitchen, reading brochures while making softly obscene noises with her mouth. Or she would put on a leotard and do yoga stretches while listening to Andreas Follenweide. I don't know what he sees in her, I once remarked to my mother. I don't know what she sees in him, she said. My father swallowed a pierogi. Know which house it was I went to today? The one on Voorhees, with the blinds always down and the overflowing trash bins in front. I knew the house. It had a jungle for a lawn and a sign near the porch that said, Yes, we live here, we like the lawn this way. And a placard depicting a pointed gun captioned, There is nothing here worth your life. What was it like inside? Like it is on the outside. Does the lady live alone? My father lowered his fork and narrowed his eyes. Why? Just wondering if a woman who lives in a place like that would get married. My father took that as a cue to wax philosophical. No matter how dented the pot, he said, there is always a lid to fit it. I watched him chew. His jowls moved under his mustache. My mother said he had too much face. When we finished dinner, my hair still wasn't dry, but it no longer bothered me. I was set free by the knowledge that I had no chance with Bahar. I could move on. I took a last look at myself in the mirror and decided I was cool after all. What girl wouldn't want me? I stepped into the night thinking of Sautra and our choice to become. Feature Toy Theater by Linda Teasel. Toy theater, also called paper theater and model theater, is a form of miniature theater from the early 19th century in Europe. The original toy theaters were printed on cardboard and as kits at English playhouses and commercial libraries for a penny plain or two pence colored. 
They included stage, scenery, actors, costumes, and scripts. The actors were freestanding or attached to sticks that moved through slots in the stage floor. People assembled the kit at home, hand-painted the stage, and costumed the players with bits of cloth and tinsel. Just as the toy-sized stage diminished a play's scale, the script abridged the text, paring it down to key characters and lines for a shorter, less complicated production. In the first half of the 19th century, London's most popular plays were issued as toy theaters. Pub publishers sent artists to the playhouses of Georgian and early Victorian London to record the scenery, costumes, and dramatic attitudes of the day. Theater managers often provided the artists with a free seat, as the toy theater sheets provided advertising. Stage theater of the early 19th century was based more on spectacle than on depth of plot or character, and this shallowness lent itself to the format of toy theater. Toward the end of the century, European popular drama shifted toward realism. Henrik Ibsen, George Bernard Shaw, and others favored psychological complexity, character motivation, and ordinary settings, house interiors, instead of palaces and mountain crags. This trend in stage theater did not make an easy transition to its toy counterpart. With the dramas of 50 years prior out of fashion, the toy theaters that remained in print became obsolete. Despite its fall in popularity, influential artists took an interest in toy theater. In 1884, British author Robert Louis Stevenson wrote an essay titled Penny Plain Two Pants Colored on toy theater's tiny grandeur. Children's authors like Lewis Carroll and Hans Christian Andersen dabbled in toy theater, as did Oscar Wilde. The brothers Jack and William Butler Leitz both used toy theaters as mock-ups for their paintings, Jack, and plays, William. In the 20th century, toy theater became a tool for the avant-garde, like futurist writer Filippo Tommaso Marinetti and painter-sculptor Pablo Picasso. Film directors like Ingmar Bergman and Orson Welles used toy theaters to block out scenes. Laurence Olivier made a toy theater of his film version of Hamlet, mass-produced with a little paper cutout of himself in the starring role. American poet Charles Simic wrote in Dime Store Alchemy, the art of Joseph Cornell, about a paper theater of, of his childhood in Belgrade. After its second boom, toy theater fell into a second slump, replaced in the 1950s by a different box in the living room that required no live operator. Sets, characters, stories, and musical numbers beamed in electronically from miles away to be projected on the glass of a cathode ray tube. Television was born. Americans missed the paper and cardboard theater for the most part, but sheet, metal, and plastic toys of the post-war era included dollhouses, model barns, railroad layouts, and theaters. In 1962, Remco released Showboat, a replica of river steamship and theater. Child entertainers could stage two-act plays in the ship, which stood 25 inches long by 14 inches tall. While it was not designed for use in water, rollers allowed it to move across the floor as if navigating a waterway. The showboat stage measured approximately 12 inches wide. Children could choose from four prepackaged plays, Heidi, Cinderella, Wizard of Oz, and Pinocchio. Each play was written especially for the company in easy to read scripts. It included pre-cut cardboard sets and a cast of characters with plastic stands. The sets were detailed with stage instructions and a series of cardboard backdrops that could be changed to match the story. A built-in curtain could also be raised and lowered as needed. Phil Fuckenbush in Havana, Illinois writes, here is my Remco showboat, which was the only thing I wanted for Christmas in 1963 at age nine. I spent hours and hours with my showboat. It is stored in my parents' attic with Christmas decorations and an architectural model of Ford's Theater in Washington, D.C. Book Review by Robert Beauregard. Seidel Creek by Jolene McElwain. Hubert Ashe, a retired mathematician living in rural western Pennsylvania, has become emotionally attached to the deer that daily cross his property. One doe in particular sustains for him the memory of his deceased wife. When a hunter kills her, Hubert is distraught. His son asks, 
why don't you come stay with me for a while? But Hubert cannot leave the woods. Quote, this is where Genevieve would come back to him again, not as a doe next time, but in some other way, unquote. The story, The Fractal Geometry of Grief, contains two themes that flow through this connection by Jolene McElwain. One is the constant struggle to reconcile the past with the present, whether over overcoming the loss of a loved one or the psychological shock of a traumatic event. In Steer, a young boy witnesses his father drag a wayward steer behind his truck until it dies. Recalling the event years later, he is still unsettled, quote, Roy put that steer's heaving limp body, its eyes, the sound of its breath, deep into the muddy mortar around his heart and felt it stiffen and hold, unquote. In Loost, confronted with few opportunities to earn enough money to support his growing family, a father starts breeding and fighting pit bull dogs, killing those who fail to perform. Later, discovering that human violence attracts a larger audience and more money, he convinces his sons to fight each other bare-fisted until one of them is too physically battered to continue. The story ends with the father, now old and infirm, begging his sons to kill him. The second theme centers on the woodlands, streams, buildings, fish, birds, and animals that figure in the lives of those who live in Appalachia. In Shell, Tyler and his Vietnamese wife, May, use the markings on eggshells of local birds to predict the future. After one reading done alone, Tiller becomes to believe that May is about to die. He rushes home, but she, he has misread the signs. Quote, she was lost. She did not remember it was Spencer who dropped off the smoked salmon, and she couldn't remember the ingredients for her favorite banana bread, their phone number, all those misplaced things, unquote. A young girl watches her father clean the rifle he used to kill the squirrels they are having for supper. In oiling the gun, Gwen wonders how she can escape, quote, all the possible worlds the gun represents. And in the title story, McElwain introduces us to 13-year-old Esme, whose mother has died and whose father is helping her with the onset of her monthly bleeding. Consulting a neighbor, he finds a remedy for Esme's pain, quote, from the steeped water in the pot, Dad took the smooth, flat stones he found near the reeds where the trout laid eggs. He placed the warm stones right on the top of my belly where Miss Jean said my ovaries and uterus ached underneath. I could feel the sidles love walking deep inside, unquote. Place matters to McElwain. Western Pennsylvania is where she grew up and where she lives today. As regards memory, McElwain is unyielding. Her characters never make peace with the past, never forget what they did or what happened. Regret is their only option, and happiness eludes them. Nonetheless, McElwain's compassion is evident. That and the deafness of her storytelling temper the bleak world of Seidel Creek. Book Review by Robert Beauregard, The City of the Living by Nicola La Gioia. On March 5, 2016, during an otherwise uneventful drive with his father, Manuel Fofo confessed to killing a man in his apartment. In Rome, he and Marco Prato, an acquaintance, had descended into a cocaine-laden, vodka-soaked, sexually charged delirium. For hours, they sent multiple text messages and made numerous phone calls to friends and acquaintances, asking them to bring over drugs, alcohol, or the cash to buy them. One who came was Luca Varani, a part-time drug dealer and male prostitute. Hoping to have sex with Luca, Marco put a date drug in Luca's drink, and the situation turned violent. Manuel and Marco stabbed Luca, hit him with a hammer, attempted to strangle him, and mutilated him with knives. They passed out on the blood-spattered bed near where Luca lay dead on the floor. La Gioia, winner of the prestigious Trega Prize in 2015 for his novel La Ferrocha, took this event and turned it into a tense psychological autopsy. According to novelist Domenico Starnon, La Gioia has breathed life into the facts of reality. Drawing on numerous interviews, extensive documentation by television and print media, and Facebook postings by WhatsApp, messages of friends and relatives of the three young men, we learn what happened and its reverberating aftermath. La Joya, though, wants us to be suspicious of any conclusive narrative. Quote, 
I made an effort to understand, but it was like looking into a well after the sun sets. And because it was perhaps in the darkness we imagined the most absurd things, that I reached the point of thinking it was the event, its intrinsic viciousness that distorted things. Evil calls up evil, and certain rhetorical forms are the instruments of contagion." Unquote. One quarter way through the book, we meet Nicola, a novelist who is asked to write about the crime. Attracted in part by the way that Luca's murder blatantly exposed the city's decay, corruption, and chaos, Nicola agrees. The murder also reminds him of a night during his wild youth when, after some heavy drinking, he almost killed a girl. Murder, Nicola thought, could be unpredictable, inexplicable, a seemingly random occurrence rather than a matter of motive. Could Marco's complicity have been predicted by his estrangement from his mother, his drug use, his prior attempts at suicide, his desire to transition to female, his manipulative streak? Was he capable of psychological cruelty, as one friend said? What about Manuel, also estranged from his family, unable to hold on to a job, addicted to cocaine, drifting through life, ashamed at having had oral sex with Marco? Then there is Luca, a gambling addict, constantly short of funds, delivering drugs on request. Luca was involved in a loving relationship with his girlfriend, Marta, but snorted coke and prostituted himself behind her back. What do we know of the people we love, the perniciousness of class, youth culture, the dark side of homosexuality, the world of illicit drugs? As the legal cases come to trial, Nicola decides he must curb his obsession. Quote, there's a moment when you dig into the murder, and then there's the next moment when it's the murder that's digging into you, mercilessly. You are transformed without realizing it into your own object of investigation. So it's the darkness, a blind spiritual void that forces its way into you." Unquote. In the end, the courts rule and the media attach themselves to another sensational tragedy, another act of corruption, another of Rome's failures. Even those psychologically scarred by the murder drift back to life's daily realities. Book review by Edward Lineberry, The Ballad of Cherry Stoke by Melanie McGee Bianchi. Melanie McGee Bianchi lives in Asheville, North Carolina. With 25 years of experience as an editor and journalist, she debuts as a writer of short stories. The title story is the haunting tale of Siobhan, the victim of a car accident that left her mentally disabled, and her no-count brother, Shad. Siobhan works as a maid in an upscale resort, and Shad, in the course of his travels, comes to live with her. Siobhan is pragmatic about the accident that altered her life, but we are left suspecting that there is more to the story. Quote, I'd gotten hit by a car from the back during my daily run 10 miles from home. The morning sun was in the driver's eyes and I was running in the middle of the road like any champion. It was pure misfortune, unquote. Shad plays the banjo claw hammer style. He becomes a fixture at the resort, entertaining the staff and eventually getting a job of his own, though his ambitions lie elsewhere. Quote, my brother was always talking about hopping trains, serious trains, freight trains. He had that addiction for bringing back the hobo life in all its miserable freedom. The bunkhouse was a freight car. At least it did it, its part to look like one. It looked like a freight car parked for good and going forever nowhere. Shad liked that, unquote. The mix of lust and violence at the resort prevents Shad from moving on, captures him as he struggles with protecting his sister and finding an escape. His presence is both impetus and resolution. When we arrive at the end, it is inevitable yet shocking. In Abdiel's Revenge, we get an outsider's pers perspective from an Eastern European immigrant named Yuri. He has absorbed the history and culture of the Appalachians through ballads and stories, some in the form of song, and some passed down as family legend. He says, if there's a main idea in all those ballads of Appalachia, it comes down to this, bones in the river, and that's cool. An ex-convict, Yuri is no stranger to violence, but he balks when his partner asks him to kill a bird that has been crashing into their bedroom window. 
The request is set against a backdrop of dark family history and Yuri's own plans when a group of vacation and college kids cause trouble in the neighborhood. A Day on Saturn is about a grandmother who experiences a sense of hot time different from those around her. She is caring for two young boys who have been dropped off by a neighbor. She is happy with the situation, content to be of help, but when her son and his girlfriend arrive, they take a different view. She sees their interference as a folly of youth. Quote, young folks today tote the future around like draft animals, so heavy and dull. It tickled me to observe them trying to steer their own fates, unquote. The Ballad of Cherry Stoke has an impressive array of characters. There's the arsonist grandmother, the trio of Brandons, the performance artist who can't mind her own business. The publisher says, an unlikely romance bridges a quarter century age gap and a 150 year old murder. A man tries to turn his sheltered mother's backyard shed into a pricey vacation rental. A gig worker must shake off her darker identity, become a professional baby namer. Each of the stories with plot twists and original imagery carries its own weight. It's a collection not to be missed.